if you would like to get great results with others, you're in the right place. That's our conversation today, inspiring great results. If you're ready, I am too. Welcome to the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. Welcome to the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. We are here each week to talk about leadership, teamwork, organizational culture, and human potential with experts from every walk of life. Your host is Kevin Eikenberry, a best-selling author and leadership thought leader for 25 years. This episode is sponsored by Kevin's book, The Long Distance Leader, Rules for Remarkable Remote Leadership. Order your copy today at remarkablepodcast.com forward slash book. And now, here's your host, Kevin. Hey, everybody. Welcome back, hopefully back, to the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. We have a great guest today. I'm going to introduce him to you just like we always do. We're going to dive right in. My guest today is Fred Halstead. He is the founder and principal of Halstead Executive Coaching. He is a trained executive coach through a program offered by the University of Texas at Dallas. His decades of experience as an executive search consultant gives him a unique perspective on leadership strengths and development. He graduated from Wabash College in Indiana, just down the road from where I am right now, and has his MBA from the University of Texas at Dallas, down the road from one of my, the members of my team, Fred. Uh, prior to his executive search and executive coaching careers, Fred served as an officer in the U.S. Uh, Armed Forces, excuse me, the Air Force, uh, and in the financial uh, management positions in industry. He has been an active volunteer as both and both a leader as both a leader and doer in his community in Dallas and now he's a guest on our show. Fred, welcome. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here and I'm I feel like I'm in high cotton for you to invite me. Well, we'll, we'll uh, I, I'm just I'm, like I said I'm glad that you're here. Now I'm going to tell all of you who are listening or watching and by the way, if you're only listening, yes, you can go to iTunes and get the video uh, podcast. But uh, we have a little bit of a delay between Fred and I. So we decided that we would have to be extra good listeners to each other so we don't interrupt each other. So for whatever reason, we have a little bit of a delay today, but I don't think that'll be a major problem. So Fred, in the intro, uh, I said a little bit about your journey. It's an interesting path that you've taken. Tell us a little bit more about your journey that leads you to being an executive coach. Well, it was sort of interesting from the standpoint that I had no experience, Kevin, in executive coaching whatsoever. And um, same thing with executive search. It just I somehow was led to doing that, tried to figure out what my strengths were, how I could most fully use them. And about, well, actually 15 years ago, I did a lot of uh, executive search in healthcare, sort of just kind of by happenstance. And I was at a large industry meeting and was talking to the CEO who was a candidate for another job I was recruiting for. He wasn't selected. I referred him to a partner in the firm and he was, and just had lunch with him. And I said, you know, Kurt, I'm thinking of, uh, going into executive coaching. And he said, Fred, you'd be great at that. And I thought, good. And he said, yeah, in fact, come down and work with my team. Oh well, my gosh. You've already got a customer. Executive search, it's like, yeah, it's like, holy cow, this is hard to get business. And now I just ask him and I've got it. So it's been a natural and really fulfilling thing for me to do. So for all of you listening who are thinking you might want to be a coach, it doesn't always work like that. Um, just, just saying, it doesn't always work like that. So what I haven't told you all yet is that Fred is the author of a brand new book. I'm, I'm holding it right here. It is cut, entitled Leadership Skills That Inspire Incredible Results. And it's a, if, if you're watching, you can see that it's a small book in terms of size. It's not super thick. It's one of the values of the book. So I'm, I love this little book, right? So, but first of all, Fred, give us a thumbnail of the book real quick. 
Well, it's a book about uh, leadership skills and much more than that, really, because it's about how a leader might become uh, even more effective through some very simple things, sound very simple, yet they're really hard to do. And so a big part of the book is motivation factors. So what it would motivate you to become a better listener, to ask more powerful questions, to give others genuine acknowledgments, to become a wiser delegator and develop your culture into one of consistent accountability. All pretty straightforward, but darn hard to do. Well, those all things are super important, and they're much easier to say than they are to do, Fred. We all know that, and I'm gonna, we're going to dive into yep. a couple of those. But as you were saying that, if you're watching me, you're seeing me look off to the side. It's because I'm looking for a, um, a, uh, a past guest that I wanted to tell everybody about. Yeah, there it is. Uh, episode number 11, a long time ago, we had on Susan Fowler, who's one of my favorite people, to talk about motivation. And so... Uh, Susan talked to us about motivation, and we, and that's one of the things, Fred, that you do, you do a great job in this book. That's not where I want us to focus, though. I've got a couple of the areas in the book that I really wanted us to dive into, and um, because they're, they are so important. And, and the thing I like about the book is that all of those skills are, that's true for all of them, uh, but I want to go to one that is uh, one that when I talk with leaders in workshops, it comes up nearly every time. And it's one that I think uh, most every self-aware human would say, I need to be better at this. And it is listening. So um, yeah. let's, let me ask. I thought that's what you'd say. Oh, <laughs> well, I'm sorry that I was so transparent. Maybe everyone else had figured it out as well. So um, what would you say, Fred, is the thing that most gets in a leader's way in terms of being a better listener? Uh, I think oneself. Okay, so say <laughs> say a little bit more about that. I mean, I agree. Yeah. Agree. Say a little bit more about that. One of the things that was really resonated with a lot of people in the, uh, in the about listening is the inhibitors to listening. So, what really blocks us from becoming a good listener? Well, there are things like uh, multitasking. You know, it's we think we can't possibly be successful if we don't do many things at the same time. And yet, the cortex of our brain processes things serially. So just one at a time. Now, a lot of bright people can process, seems like parallel, but it doesn't really happen. So if people can be more disciplined in concentrating on just listening to the person to, to whom is speaking to you, you're going to be far more respected. They're going to respect you. You're going to learn more, and it's just going to turn out much better. So getting inhibitors out of the way, like multitasking, like um, I would say having ideas about another person. I'm thinking, okay, uh, Kevin, you're this background. I'm talking to you about something that's entirely different. You can't possibly understand. And so I don't think you're going to offer anything. So I won't listen to you. I'm going to give you a perfect example of that, Fred. I want to come back to something else you said. I'm going to go okay. right there because actually bias was one of the things I wanted us to talk about uh, today. And it's a perfect example. So I'm with a client, well, I was with a client a few days ago, but the first, before I met with them the first time, uh, it's an organization that is in the coal mining business. And their first question, one of their first questions to me is, so Kevin, have you ever been in a coal mine? Kevin, have you ever worked with coal miners? And my answer was no, uh, but all I need is an opportunity, you're right. Uh, when can I come to the mine? So I did, and I went down, and we did work with together and all that stuff. But the point, to your exact point, like until they s sensed that I knew what it was like underground, it wasn't going to matter. And the rea th and there are two realities that while I truly enjoyed being down there for two, three hours, right? I didn't really know any more about their business than I did before I went down, really. 
first, first truth. Second truth is that their issues, this is not going to surprise you, Fred, their issues are 99% the same, regardless of whether they're uh, in retail or in mining or it doesn't matter, right? And so, but the point is yes. that filter, I mean, I love the way you say that, 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 that if we, our beliefs about the other person play such a huge role and guess what? We get to choose those beliefs, right? Yes. Yeah. And it gets back in part to this issue of respect. So they want to be heard. They want you to believe that they're unique, that their business is, is complex. And so the more you can listen to them and ask them questions, the more they're going to be comfortable, trust you and respect you while you're showing them respect. Yeah. And yeah. that's a big motivation for listening. Yeah. And of course the example that I used was about me in, in a, in a, in a consult, I mean, in a customer situation, customer supplier situation. But I think the other point that you made a minute ago is so very important that for us as the leader, where there's a power differential between us and that other person, that when we are truly listening, uh, the other point that you made was that it's sending another message to that person, right? That, that, mm -hmm. that idea of respect is so valuable that when our folks see us as respecting them, valuing them, that it changes everything about the relationship and their motivation and everything else. And that, and that, that, that can be done by simply listening to them. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And when we respect someone in some ways, we're going to be, this is skipping ahead a little bit, but we're going to be tougher on them than we might otherwise be because we have high expectations for them. We respect them. And the listening part is particularly important because it signals that you really care about that other person. Not only you respect them, but you care about them. And what they have to say is important. And what happens too is if you really listen to someone, they're going to be more careful about what they say to you because they know that you're listening. Yeah, that you know, the old joke of, you know, you don't think someone's listening, so you start saying a bunch of really silly stuff and they're just nodding their head, right? Well, if they know you're really listening, they're going to be careful about what they're going to say. I hadn't thought about uh -huh. that in quite that way, but I think you're exactly you're exactly right. You so you sort of slid by this big idea about expectations that um, our expectations of our folks makes a difference. So say a little bit more about, I mean, I agree, but say a little bit more about that. Well, I think every one of us can remember going way back to our youth, a teacher that we thought was the toughest teacher we had. And if someone says, what teacher do you remember? It's going to be that one that was toughest. And what do we think really in our subconscious almost? That person respected us. They had high expectations of us. And that's what we appreciated. Low expectations aren't particularly appreciated. They are maybe at the moment. Let's, <laughs> I'm getting a pass here, you know? Right. But if you hold me, my feet to the fire, Kevin, that shows that you expect that I'm going to have high performance. Well, and, and of course, simply making clear what the expectations are is a starting point. But I think you're exactly right that as we, as we ratchet up our expectations of folks and they are clear to people, um, then people tend to live up to them, right? And yes, super, super important. Or down to them. Exactly, up or down. And so if it's a choice we have to make, why not choose the higher one? And here's the other thing I would say back to listening is that if I really, if I will really listen to someone, um, then I'm not only am I showing respect by the, in the doing of it, as we've already talked about, but I'm probably going to learn some things that will actually lead me to have that higher expectation, or I can see the potential that, that I might not have, that I might've missed if I stayed with my initial bias of how they looked or what their background was or whatever that, that bias might be. Right. So I think it's super, super important. Um, along with listening, Fred, a piece that comes with it that you do a great job talking about in the book is 
questions and the power of questions. And I want you to dive into that in just a second. I want to tell all of those of you listening that we've had three other, what I would call excellent folks on about questions. And that, um, so if you really, you're going to love what Fred and I are going to talk about, but you want to go back and listen to Bob Teedy and Warren Berger, who's just recently been on, like, a couple of weeks ago uh, as this comes out and then all the way back to one of my favorite oh, coaches one of my favorite coaches which is Michael Bungay Stanier so in episode 38 so but I want to talk about questions and how do you def you talk about powerful questions how do you define a powerful question Fred a powerful question is a question that gets to the heart of an issue it's sort of like the bullseye of what's really important. And so in order to find that out, you have to ask, I think, an open-ended question. And the best open-ended question starts with one word, and that's what. What? What is not, uh, is an inviting word in the sense of I'm inviting your thinking. If I say, Kevin, why did you do this? Then automatically you're thinking, oh, now I got to defend myself. Yeah. And so you're in defensive mode rather than the sharpest thinking mode, I would suggest. In fact, that's what I've seen when I coach people. Um, so a powerful question is one that is asked in the right way at the right time. And the right way, again, is open-ended. It doesn't include multiple choice. And it doesn't include yes or no questions. So it really invites the person to think and invites you and gives you the opportunity to learn. So to all of you listening, you just got something worth the whole time here. To think about the question as an invitation is such a great way to think about it, right? Uh, and, and so you said that so, so very well, Fred, and I appreciate that. Um, another thing that I loved about how you talked about questions in the book, and we are talking with Fred Halstead, we're talking about his new book, Leadership Skills That Inspire Incredible Results. And um, one of the things you did, so I mean, it's, question is just one of the seven things that you talk about in the book, uh, big, big ideas, but you, you talk about something that most people don't spend much time on. It's the idea and of timing. So how can you better time your questions? By listening. It's really interesting. The best questioners are those that listen. What I tell leaders, and I'm fortunate to work at high levels of organizations, is when you truly listen, you don't have to prepare as much because you're listening to that person. You're going to pick up on what they say. You incorporate it with what you know or you think you know, and you ask a question about that. And that en enhances their thinking. It drills down to the most important aspect of what's going on. And it responds to what you've heard them say. You know, um, people often say, well, Kevin, how do you prepare for a one-on-one -on -one meeting with one of your team members? And I say two things, uh, what's my goal and what are my questions, right? And to your point, yeah. doesn't mean I don't, doesn't, you said we have to prepare less and I would agree, we have to prepare differently, right? Because we're not saying, well, here are the 24 things I wanna say, but what, what are the five, what are, my, what are my goals and what are, my, what are five questions that I might use, I might not use, to your point, I might only need one of them before we're done, right? Mm -hmm. um, if I will then, mm -hmm. and I will say this less elegantly than you would, Fred, but if we will just shut up and listen, uh, we'll be far ahead, right? So um, anything else about timing on questions that you want to share? Yes, I think that, that the timing issue sometimes can mean that you interrupt someone. And you interrupt them often by repeating what they said, affirming what they've said, and then you ask them a question that gets them back on track. 
because we all can have a tendency to go down some rabbit trails. Yeah. And if we've got someone who's truly helping us to stay on track and develop our sharp thinking on the issue at hand, um, we're going to do much better. I interrupt people when I'm coaching them. And I don't even believe they're particularly aware of that because it's remaining on the subject, basically. It's not like, oh, we're going on a totally different direction here. So the timing has to do with really listening and giving yourself permission to interrupt in a way that is not at all offensive. In fact, it's encouraging to the person as they think about it. A really great point because I think that, um, I mean, all of, I, I am quite confident, Fred, in the 20 plus minutes that you and I have been talking that I, un, I'm talking about unintentionally now, not intentionally, that I unintentionally, I am confident that I interrupt more often than you do just because of the nature of our communication styles. And yet, if I watch, if you watch other conversations, you will see people interrupting. We all interrupt. Your point, I think, is so valuable because it's about doing it intentionally and you're not doing, the, the big interrupters that you think of in your life are the, that bother you are the people that are interrupting to change the subject, to take over the conversation. Mm -hmm. What Fred is saying is he's interrupting with the intent and express purpose of keeping us on track and actually helping the speaker rather than derailing the speaker. That is super smart and really, really uh, useful for everybody that's, that's listening. And, yes, thank you. And another key point here in the interrupting is I'm not interrupting to tell you what I think. That's what can get us to, right? I mean, I, I heard you, Kevin, now I'm going to tell you what I think. I'm interrupting you to further explore your thinking, not mine. And yet, through the question I ask you, it is reflective of my thinking. And yet, you accept it because I'm inviting you to think even harder about it. Exactly. And, you know, I think, I wish I had, I wish I had the data on this. And since I don't, I'm going to make it up. Um, I'll bet half of the interruptions, and that's a made-up number, everybody. So don't go quote me on that. Have it on the internet that I can very say that it's half. But a huge percentage of interruptions is to your point. Start with the word but. Right? And they start there because they're not doing what Fred's saying that we should do uh, at all, which is, I think, really dead on. You said you used another, there's a, again, we've talked about the fact that there's in this small Book, small and powerful book, there are a number of things that you talk about. You talk about delegation, you talk about accountability, very practical stuff there. We could do whole, a whole episode or a whole conversation on those. But I really, as we start to get ready to shift gears here, I want to have you talk briefly about acknowledgement. You and I talked about it briefly before I hit record. Uh, but talk to me about what, from your perspective, what acknowledgement is and why it matters to us as a leader. Thanks. Before I do that, I want to stress just one point that you brought up, and that's a three-letter word, but. We're not as cognizant as we could be. When we say but, what, when we hear that, we, what do we think? We think, okay, the person didn't hear me. They don't care about what I said. They think I'm wrong. If we say, and what about this? then the conversation keeps going, their mind keeps moving in a positive direction. Um, this idea of genuine acknowledgments uh, is, is really a, a neat one. I'll tell you a quick story. Um, one of the most senior guys I ever coached uh, told me, he said, Fred, I don't give my people compliments. They don't need that. They pay them, pay them very well. They're self-confident. They don't need any of that. Well, he came to learn that they really do. He said, I don't need it. And I have give it, given it to him fairly regularly. And he always appreciates it. The reason he appreciates it 
And the reason that there is a big difference between a compliment and a genuine acknowledgement are these things. First of all, a compliment is a nice thing to say. You know, that's a good looking white shirt. So nice. But if I say, Kevin, one of the things I noticed when I was listening to your podcast, and even since we've been talking, is your great enthusiasm for your work. And you also do homework. You, you apparently read my book. And so I greatly appreciate that. Which one resonates with you more? Well, of course, the second one, it's, it's, it's more meaningful. It's more, yeah. more sincere. There's, there, there, you know, there's so much more to it than the first one, right? Um, for sure. And I think, you know, the interesting thing and is... In the business setting... Please, go ahead. So in the business setting, uh, the big difference, too, is, and in a family setting, you know, you are a very successful person. When you give someone a genuine acknowledgement, that has a lot of gravitas. That means something. It's coming from you. And a genuine acknowledgement is very specific. It has detail. And it requires observation. I can just look and see, oh, that's a nice white shirt. But I had to really observe and think about you right. in order to make that genuine acknowledgement. And that's what makes it highly powerful. And it makes it inspirational. Because when you give a genuine acknowledgement to virtually anyone, you're encouraging them to do more of whatever you, it is that you're acknowledging. I, I so it's agree. a great way to inspire people. And it's always genuine. You never want to be sloppy in it or untruthful in it. Or as I say in the book, no fluff or puff. You just say it and leave it. And, and that, that line I think is so important because I've had the same conversation that you mentioned with your, with your coaching client a hundred times in, a work, in workshops, right? And too many people or, or many people, many leaders associate any positive feedback or acknowledgement as simply being puff and fluff because they think it is just nice shirt, uh, appreciate you, right? Whatever, very general, very non-specific, uh, you know, easy to throw off your the tongue, all that stuff. And so, you know, for if you're listening and you say, well, I, you know, I, I, I don't need that feedback. And the other interesting thing that you said is that person who says, well, I don't need any of that feedback loves getting it. And they're not even noticing, noticing that they're loving getting it, right? Sometimes people say, well, I got here without it, so they should too. And I'm like, why do we have to make this a, a fraternity hazing approach, right? Why can't we do what would get people there faster rather than just because I survived, why do I have to let them survive? Why can't I help them thrive, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. I, I love that. I love and it's that. To, again, Go ahead. No, go ahead, please. Well, I was just going to say, I love... Again, it's a great way to inspire people um, and create an opportunity for them to keep doing what you appreciate they're doing. And it continues to fall in the pattern of, this isn't about me. This is about making you successful. And those leaders who focus on making everyone around them successful, sounds counterintuitive, but they're going to be more successful. Those leaders who are very worried about their career, their success in any project, whatever it is, how they look, are going to have a much tougher sledding. I would go as far as to say, Fred, that that's the big idea of your book right there. Is that fair? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. I, think, I mean, it comes through throughout yeah. the book and I haven't read, I have to be honest, I haven't read every single page, but I've read a lot of it and, and I can, I can 100% uh, recommend it to everyone who's listening. And again, the title is leadership skills that inspire incredible results. And it's Fred Halstead who I'm talking with and you're listening to right now. So we got a couple more things we need to do before we 
finish, Fred, and one of them is, you, you know, you had a long and uh, interesting and successful life and you are doing your work and you're working in the community. Uh, but tell me what you do for fun. Well, there are a number of things. I have three delightful granddaughters. Um, been married a long time and I still enjoy my wife. Uh, I Here's enjoy some snow skiing, fly fishing. Yeah, big win. Um, play golf. Um, and I enjoy uh, serving other people outside of coaching. Um, I really get some some pleasure out of that, sharing what gifts I've been given. I think that comes very through, comes through very clearly to all of us who are uh, having the, some time with you now, Fred. So tell us what you are reading or you've read recently. Uh, and every, I mean, I do this with every guest. I've got my pen so loud, I'm ready to go. Uh, anybody, uh, you might want to do the same, but we'll put that the answer in the show notes in case you are you know, running right now and you can't write down what, what we're about to say. But Fred, what are you reading or what's something you read recently that people might find of value or of interest? Well, uh, it's not a, a business book most recently. It's Unshakable Hope by Max Licato. And it's a, it's a Christian book. Uh, and yet he is a, not only a skillful writer, but I am intrigued with the way he takes himself. He takes what he does seriously, but he has a ca almost casual style, not sloppy, but casual that one might emulate in terms of approaching other people and communicating with other people. Yeah, Max is a skilled facilitator. He's not someone that I've met, but uh, he's a skilled facilitator, great writer. And uh, so the book is Unshakable Hope. And so we'll have that in the show notes for everybody. So uh, Fred, how can we learn more about you and your work and the book and all of that stuff? Well, uh, you can go on my website. Thank you. Uh, HolsteadExecutiveCoaching.com. Uh, it's a pretty good website, I think. And it will lead you not only the book, but to the kind of the process I use in coaching. The book was based on uh, largely a program I give by the same name. So I've given this program to hundreds of executives. And it's a really, it's a way to try and make these uh, skills more come alive and to figure out ways to motivate yourself to actually use them. Because as you mentioned earlier, they're simple, straightforward skills, and yet they are impossible to master. But the idea is to get better at them. And even that's not easy. So you have to figure out what's gonna motivate you. What is your purpose? Why are you doing this? Because it's hard to start asking what questions. It's hard to stop telling people right off the bat what you think and ask them what they think. That's tough. Yes, it is. You're smart. You're successful. You just want to tell people what they, what you think. We got other stuff to do. Let me just tell you what to go do. Um, so yeah. listen, everybody, I want to just, since I, at this moment, I'm likely the only, as you are listening and the only person here, um, other than Fred, who's read the book. And so while he has said that he's worked, works with executives and he's used the, done the program with executives, let me be very clear. This book is accessible and valuable to leaders at any level, uh, including executives. And so uh, don't let that be off-putting if that's not you yet. Uh, I would say that for sure. So now I have a question for all of you who are listening and watching, and that is now what? What are you going to do? What are you going to do with the ideas that, you, that Fred and I have been talking about? How, what are you going to do differently as a listener later today or tomorrow? How are you or when are you going to ask more what questions? How are you going to be more patient as a listener? How are you going to interrupt intentionally and effectively if you need to do that? And a hundred other things that we've talked about. My challenge to you is to take some action from what you got, not just 
having enjoyed the conversation and sort of nodded your head. Uh, take a moment and think about what's one thing that you got that you can go apply right away. If it's ever been true in any episode, it would be certainly true here. So Fred, thanks so much for joining me and us today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. To have you. Yeah. All right. So everybody, that's a wrap on another episode. And so we'll be back again next week with another episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. I hope you'll join us then. Thanks again, everybody, and have a great day.